Welcome to the Real Estate Investor Podcast. I'm your host, Gary Lipsky of Break of Day Capital. I talk to leading experts to discuss a wide range of subjects to educate investors on best-in-class practices to build legacy wealth and positively impact communities. Let's jump in. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Real Estate Investor Podcast. Today on the podcast, I have Brian Davis. Brian is a real estate investor, personal finance writer, and co-founder of Spark Rental with over two decades in the real estate and financial industries. He owns fractional shares in over 2,000 units and regularly contributes as a real estate and personal finance expert for Bigger Pockets, InMan, Best Ever Real Estate, Real Estate Tipster, and more. Hey, everyone. We have launched the BODC Multifamily Impact Fund. Invest with a trusted operator with a track record of success. Our fund offers diversification, risk mitigation, tax benefits, and stringent acquisition criteria. If you'd like to learn more, head over to our website at breakofdaycapital.com. Choosing the right insurance coverage for multifamily properties isn't that complicated, if you know who to talk to. At the Garzella Group, we're uniquely qualified to help you navigate the range of policy choices you have, and we're committed to saving you 30% in the process. We do intensive market research and have nationwide relationships, so we can find coverage other insurance brokers simply can't. We should talk. Go to quotenow.biz, and we'll start the conversation. Thanks for joining us, Brian. Can you start by telling the listeners a little bit more about yourself and what you do? Sure. So, Gary, first of all, thanks for having me on the show. Um I I fell into real estate by accident. I started working for a hard money lender right out of college who just happened to be buddies with my stepdad. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I was watching all these guys make money hand over fist in real estate back in the, the mid aughts. And you know, I thought I could do this too, right? Like, so I went out and I put all my savings into rental properties and then totally fell flat on my face you know to, <laughs> as as so you know happens to so many of us when we first get started but you know I just I didn't get a mentor I didn't get a coach I didn't get a senior partner I just had that arrogance of youth oh, I'm just gonna I gotta figure it out as I go and you know and then yeah you know 2008 hit and you all know what happened <laughs> so you know, I, I pivoted. I, I went, and well, I'll tell you what actually sucks about that is that not only did my investments fall flat on on their face, but I lost my day job too, right? Because no one's actually taking out hard money loans anymore. No one's flipping houses anymore. So I had to find a new career. Went and I worked for an e commerce company for a while, who was servicing mom and pop landlords, mom and pop real estate investors, and you know the only reason I got that job is because I had direct experience, right? So, you know, as they say, a door closes, a window opens. That's how that stuff works out. So, in 2016, a, a former colleague and my uh, from that company, we went and launched Spark Rental. And our our initial vision for the company was to make a like a one-stop shop property management software platform for mom and pop landlords. And it's it's funny as entrepreneurs quickly discover, you know, what you think that your business is going to be uh, often is not what the market tells you your business should be. So you know we 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 did eventually launch a a landlord software platform, but it took a lot longer than we thought it would, and there were a lot of twists and turns along the way. You know, our, our software developer ran off with our money, you know, all that kind of stuff, and we ended up building initially a business around education and teaching real estate investing. And then, you know, another pivot came when a lot of our our course students and our audience members at large, you know, they kept coming to us and asking, like, hey, can we just invest with you guys on some of the deals that you're investing in? And we kept saying no. You know, I had moved overseas by that point, and my partner was no longer actively investing either. So we kept saying no to people. And then we were like, ah, it feels a little out of alignment. You know, we're 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 teaching something, but we're not actually doing it right now. Um, so we decided, Hey, what if, what if we said yes? Like, what would that look like to say yes to people? So we uh, partnered with a boots on the ground, real estate investor here in the States and did a couple single family deals as just like joint ventures. 
uh, opening them up for like, you know, fractional investing with some of our audience members where, you know, we're all just kind of going in on these together as like a learning exercise. And it was great. You know, we, we made perfectly fine returns and, you know, we had fun. We learned a lot together doing these. It was way too much work. <laughs> like it was, it was way too much work. You know, so my partner, Denny and I look at each other like, yeah, there's a reason no one else is doing this, right? Like it's just, it's just, it's too much work. We weren't actually charging for this. It was just a, a bonus that we were offering our, our course students. And it was around that time that I had started investing personally in real estate syndications. So I was like, well, you know, Denny, you know, going out and actually buying properties, that might be too much work. But what if we did, what if we went in on like a real estate syndication with, with some of our, our course students and our audience members? So she said, well, you know, I don't know a ton about them, but why not? Let's try it. So we did a pilot deal. And that is how our co-investing club was born. And it, that's become our main focus as a business. But it certainly didn't start out that way. I mean, you know, we've, we've had a winding path over the years with the different services that we offer for real estate investors. You know, started out all services for you know mom and pop active investors, and we still offer all of those. Uh, but now our our main focus is this co-investing club, where every month. We go in on a different real estate deal together, different syndication deal together. We vet the deal together as a club. We bring in different sponsors and uh, any of our members who want to invest in that deal can do so with relatively small amounts, uh, five grand in, in our case. Uh, and together, you know, collectively, we'll hit that 50 grand, 100 grand, 250 grand minimum investment. Uh, but it's a way for us to each invest small amounts and spread our money across a lot more deals a lot more cities and states and sponsors and property types and all that stuff. So it's, it's fun. It's different. I love it. Uh, I think, you know, when, when people get in probably two things, you either got the one person that's like all in and invested in a lot of different deals and doesn't know how to do the due diligence or the other person who um, analysis by paralysis, who can't get, uh, you know, is is researching deals for years and years and years and and doesn't do anything. So it's great to have a resource like what you provide, where you can do the due diligence together, provide um, you know your your years of experience to help other people kind of get started in in this uh, investing uh, space. Uh, so kudos to you. Obviously, yeah. Every I, I think everyone has their own kind of winding journey, and and I see so many that are like shiny object you know they jump on one thing then the other and 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 that ability to focus is so important because there's just there's plenty of ways to make money but if you don't if you don't focus on any one thing you can't get good at it um and and you also mentioned active versus passive and i think um uh, you know people you know want to start doing their own deals or you know the the one to four units and then soon realize this is a lot of freaking work and you know the margins are so so small investing with a team of experts can be a really good way to go where you can enjoy the lifestyle and not have to deal with it Let, let's that's actually a really good segue because um you 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 talk about living a financially independent uh lifestyle what what does that mean to you yeah so i i'm overseas we've been overseas for nine years now my my wife and me, we started, we spent four years in Abu Dhabi, spent four years in Brasilia. We just moved to Lima, Peru last June. We'll be here for at least another year and some change. And one of the one of the core themes that we return to again and again when we when we work with people, when we write about this stuff, when we in our podcast, we talk about how you don't need to be financially independent to live the same lifestyle that you would be living if you were financially independent. And that's a that's a hard concept for people to wrap their heads around because when most people think of reaching financial independence and retiring early, you know the whole fire movement, they think of like sitting on a beach and sipping piña coladas on a tropical island for the rest of their life, right? That's not reality. That that you know so if you did reach financial independence, you could go do that for a month or two and then you would be bored, right? You'd be bored to death. You know, you'd, you'd have the DTs, you'd have the shakes, you know, you'd, you'd feel like you have no purpose or meaning in your life. So what would you do? You go back to work. Now, I mean, I've, I've interviewed probably hundreds by now. I, I always just say dozens, but it's probably over a hundred people now who have reached financial independence, usually through real estate, but sometimes, you know, in other means. 
And they all went back to work. <laughs> I mean, because there's just only so long that you can sit around twiddling your thumbs, doing nothing if you retire young. So, you know, a lot of people, when they first hear that, they get really disappointed, right? They, they're like, oh, well, then what's the point of, you know, trying to have a really high savings rate and push really hard towards reaching financial independence at a young age? And I, I want to reframe that for people and say, no, this is actually really good news. This means that you don't need nearly as much money as you thought you needed to get to the the lifestyle that you really want, right? Because ultimately, that life, that FI lifestyle, you know, it's not sitting on the beach, right? It's doing your ideal work, work that's very meaningful to you, you know, on your own schedule, right? Working your own hours, uh, maybe geographically independent, right? You know, so wherever you choose to be, uh, but you have total control over all that stuff. And it's work that you're super passionate about work, which in many cases may not pay as much as you currently earn, right? Uh, or in some cases, it might. I mean, in, for some people, in which case, like, what are you doing? Like, do quit, quit now, right? And go go do your ideal work now if it pays as much. If it doesn't pay as much, that's fine. You just need some extra income to cover the difference, right? Or you could just spend less. I mean, you could <laughs> you could you could cut your budget and just spend less now, uh, and and switch to your dream work now as well. Uh, but if you don't want to spend less, then there's probably just a little bit of shortfall, right? There's a gap between what you want to spend and what your dream work pays, and you just need some passive income to fill that gap. And that's going to be a lot less passive income than what you would need to totally replace. Your your high octane, high stress nine to five job, so you just need to get intentional about it. Figure out what's your ideal work. Figure out what does it pay. Figure out what kind of budget are you willing to live on every year. And if there is a gap there, you just need to fill it in with some passive income from investments. Make it sound really easy. I think a lot of people have that kind of mental hurdle. I mean, how how have you helped people? You know take that leap of, of faith and, 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 and do that because it's so foreign, you know, it's particularly to Americans. I think maybe more, you know, you know, in other countries, it's, you know, they, they have so much more vacation and it's like, I get, I get allergic with like, after like a week, uh, you know, being away and it's like, you know, I have to, I have to change it. So how, how have you helped people kind of overcome that, that hurdle? Yeah. I mean, you know, it starts with just getting really clear on what you actually want, right? You know, and and starting with that intentionality. You know, what is your ideal work? What does that look like? You know, how many hours a week are you going to be working? It's probably full time or, or close to it. And for most people, if it's work that you're really passionate about, um, so it's just it starts there. You know, where would you live geographically? You know, what what kind of hours do you want to work? Uh, you know, what kind of work do you want to do? What kind of income can you potentially earn from this? So it really, it starts there. And that, those answers are going to be different for every single person, right? I mean, every, you know, we could get a hundred people in this room and we'd get a hundred different answers for those questions. Uh, so for me, I mean, I, I have no problem working, you know, 40, 50, 60 hours a week doing stuff that I love, but I also want the flexibility, right? I want to be able to work from anywhere in the world. I want to be able to travel all over the world. Uh, and we do, uh, you know, we do a ton of travel. I want to be able to take things like a, what I call a red month, where I take a big red marker and, and cross through the entire calendar month and say, I'm not available this month. You know, I'm not available for conference calls or for interviews or for any of that stuff. You know, maybe I'll keep up with email, but that's it. And uh, yeah, I want to be able to do that. So, we, and I have, I mean, I, my, my wife and daughter and I spent a month trekking around Patagonia in Argentina a year and some change ago. Uh, and I, I love doing that stuff. Uh, so yeah, you just have to get clear on what, all of that looks like for you and then start piecing it together. And you know, I'll give you one other kind of way to, to help get over some of these mental hurdles. When we first started Spark Rental back in 2016, you know, it didn't make any money, of course, right? It was a startup business. Uh, and you know, half of our, more than half of our startup capital we lost to that software developer who ran off with it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, we it wasn't making any money at that time. You know, businesses take time to get off the ground. It takes money to get off the ground. So, what did my partner and I do? We just took on side hustles to help extend that runway and to help you know cover any costs in the meantime. So, in her case, she was a licensed realtor. She just picked up a little bit more work on the side as a realtor. In my case, I picked up some freelance writing. Uh, I've always loved writing. Uh, I, I 
you know, have, yeah. So I, I went out and I got gigs as a freelance writer and that helped supplement our, our income from Spark Rental as it started coming in. Uh, it also let my wife sleep at night <laughs> knowing that there was an income floor, right? And actually, I still do a little bit of freelance writing to this day because I enjoy it because it makes my wife feel better. Uh, you know, so she can, she, you know, she's like, well, you know, worst case scenario, you know, if, if, if your business implodes, you know, at least you can make money as a freelance writer. So it makes her feel better. Uh, so yeah, you can you can start piecing together these different streams of income, both active income and passive income. And sooner or later, it all comes together and you can live the lifestyle that you want to live, even if you're not yet financially independent. Love it. I love it. I think, yeah, so many people are are, are afraid to make that leap, but uh, more and more people are talking about it, which is uh, which is great because it's not um, it's not one way to to make a living and, and have a life. There's so many different options, and uh, if people took that leap of faith and, like you said, that intentionality and and thinking to yourself what what does that look like you know it it it's it doesn't have to be that you know nine to five and you know you get your two weeks of vacation and then and that's that and and maybe you you travel um to a foreign country you know once every you know few years but uh, you're living the life um and 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 certainly working too um but it's 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 not nearly as out of out of reach as, as as so many people think. Yeah, and I'll 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 just share one other thing that makes all of this way easier is finding a way to score free housing. <laughs> that opens up so many more possibilities for you. I mean, first of all, if you are pursuing financial independence, maybe you want to retire early, if you can knock out your housing payment, I mean, that's typically 25 to 50% of your budget right there. So you can boost your savings rate immediately by 25 to 50% and really accelerate how quickly you build wealth, how quickly you build passive income. Um, but it also, you can, it, that might get you over the hump to switching to your dream work as well, right? If you can drop your, your spending budget, your annual spending budget by that amount that you have been spending on housing, that too, you know, maybe you don't need any passive income in order to bridge that gap. You know, maybe you can quit your day job now and go start doing your dream work if housing payments are not an issue. So, you know, you can look into things like house hacking, of course. Uh, you know, I mean, when I bought my first home, I rented out a room to a housemate and her her rent covered three quarters of my my mortgage payment. Um my my partner Denny, she's she's gotten more creative than that. She's uh, brought in a, a foreign exchange student at one point. So for four years, she and her husband, they were empty nesters at the time. She's older than I am. And they didn't, they weren't ready to sell their commercial or their, uh, their big suburban house yet as empty nesters, but it was kind of expensive. And so they brought in a foreign exchange student and they hosted him for four years. And that stipend that the, the agency paid covered their entire mortgage payment. Or close to it. I mean, it's like maybe a hundred bucks off or something. But yeah, so you can do these sorts of things. They've rented out storage and garage space before. I mean, they get creative with it. Uh, so house hacking is one option for that. We today we don't pay for housing because my wife's job provides it for us. So you know that's another route that you can look at is you know employer provided housing. So you just want to get creative in in looking at your largest structural expenses and finding ways. To reduce them, I'll give you another very quick example of that. Is transportation is the the second largest expense for most people. Uh, cars are not only expensive in themselves, but they come with a lot of other ancillary expenses too, like insurance and and maintenance and repairs and gas and parking and all these things. So the the latest number from AAA, it's something like tw it's twelve, it's over twelve thousand dollars a year is the the total cumulative cost of a car in the United States. To own a car, that's crazy expensive, right? So if you can get rid of a car, you know, if you're married, for example, can you go down to one car? Can you find a way to make that work? You can save a lot of money there. My wife and I dropped down to one car when we moved to Abu Dhabi. And when we moved from Abu Dhabi to Brasilia, we were moving within uh, walking or biking distance of my wife's school. So we're like, well, maybe we can live without a car entirely. And we did, and we don't. We haven't had a car since. So I mean, again, it saves us a ton of money every year. It makes it a lot easier to build wealth quickly and live that financially independent lifestyle. That's awesome. 
So I got a question. What is one of your hardest real estate uh, lessons to date? Oh, man. The the one, the go-to, I'll give you two. One that is more obvious and one that's a little less obvious. So the obvious one, when I started buying rental properties, I didn't even know how to forecast cash flow. I mean, this is, and it's embarrassing to say now, but you know, I'm running around thinking that cash flow is the rent minus the mortgage. Like, <laughs> I, I was not accounting for those irregular but inevitable expenses, like vacancy rate, you know, like repairs and maintenance and, and property management. Uh, so, your audience, you know, they they're all familiar with that stuff at this point. So, I won't harp on that. I'll tell you another difficult lesson that that I had is that lower income properties come with a lot of hidden expenses that don't show up on paper. Even when you do learn how to actually forecast expenses properly, you can still get into trouble because a lot of the expenses that come with lower end rental properties, um, they, they're, they're hidden. So one example of that is property management. So property managers, of course, get paid as a, as a percentage of the the rents, right? Uh, you know, whether we're talking about the the annual collection or the the, the monthly collection or the, the fee for filling new units. But lower income properties, lower income rentals tend to come with more difficult and higher maintenance renters. So you're looking at more work for less money. So good property managers, high skill, high professionalism property managers just don't work with those properties, right? Because they don't have to. You end up with the the dregs of property managers servicing those properties, and that took me a long time to to figure out. It's like, oh, you know, why is it so hard to find a good property manager, someone who's actually professional and actually does all the things that they say they're going to do? Well, it's because those people weren't working with the kind of properties that I owned. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that's one example, but there's a, a million of those examples. You know, crime is another one. So, I mean, I can't tell you how many. Uh, air conditioning condenser units have just been totally ripped apart at at my properties because people were going in trying to get the copper out, right? Or you know how many times I've had buildings broken into and appliances stolen and you know plumbing stolen, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and there's sometimes you get those secondary effects from that crime too, where it's not even where you are a direct victim of it. It's those good tenants of yours, the, the kind of people you actually want in the property, they move out because they don't like the crime. So crime is another one. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, oh, turnover rates. You know, the turnover rates for these properties tend to be a lot higher. And when you're an income investor, that's where most of the work lies. And that's where most of the expense lies in owning these rental properties. It's in turnovers, right? You got to repaint the unit, maybe recarpet it, and you got to go in and advertise and show the unit and all these things. That's where all the work lies. That's where all the the, the costs lies. When you don't have turnovers, it is more passive, right? You, know, you can sit back and just collect your, your rent and, and feel happy about it and whistle all the way to the bank. Uh, but the higher turnover rates is very costly. So when when I talk to people about some of the expensive lessons that I've learned, that was definitely one of them. That it's a niche. It, low income rental properties are a niche, and you need to learn that niche skill set beyond all the other skills that you need to learn as a real estate investor. And if you don't learn those skills, you're going to lose money. Absolutely, absolutely. It's it's a lot more. Certainly, there's good money to be made there, but uh, a lot more headaches. Uh, Brian, great, great advice. I uh, really appreciate you coming on, talking about your uh, your lifestyle and how you can anyone can achieve it uh, if they put their mind to it. Uh, where can listeners find out uh, more about you and Spark Rental? Yeah, come to SparkRental.com. And reach out to me personally if you want, Brian at SparkRental.com. We're also on all the major social media platforms. We have a few Facebook groups that are pretty big. We've got one that's around 48,000 for active investors and around 8,000 for passive investors. Uh, but yeah, come check us out. We have a, a an extremely generous refund program. We want people to come and, and join our investment club and attend a first meeting. And then if you decide that it's not for you, because this really is not for everybody, right? Uh, if it's not for you, then leave and we'll give you your money back. I mean, you know, it's, it's, we, we want people to come and check it out and test drive it, you know, kick the tires and then decide if it's for them, if they want this like fractional investing approach 
to their passive real estate investments. Uh, but it's a it's a great thing to be able to spread small amounts across a lot of different deals and geographical markets and sponsors and all that stuff. Low stress, right? At the end of the year, it's just numbers on a page instead of that hundred grand that you have tied up in one property that you're chewing your nails about and worrying about. Maybe there's a capital call that you're worried about. Uh, yeah, when you invest small amounts across a lot of deals, it's just numbers on a page at the end of the year. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Brian. This is Gary Lipsky signing off. I'll be back next week with another informative episode on the Real Estate Investor Podcast. To all of our listeners, thanks for joining us. And if you like this episode, please head over to iTunes or Stitcher and like, subscribe, and leave a review as it will help us reach more people. And if you'd like to learn more about what we do at Break of Day Capital, head over to our website at breakofdaycapital.com and sign up for our newsletter and fill out our investor application. We'll talk to you next week.